Ok, guys, eh, realmente una semana muy dinámica. Una, una semana en la cual hemos estado conociendo personas que cada una de ellas, de una manera u otra, nos muestran um, cómo cuando uno literalmente se enfoca y comienza con determinación a enfocarse en una industria y ver cómo uno puede innovar y disruptir o, o de una manera u otra crecer en esa industria, uno puede evolucionar y convertirse en un ícono. Y bueno, empezamos esta semana con Dr. G, luego fuimos con uh, The Billionaire Barber, eh, tuvimos un podcast interno. Miami no ha parado desde el día que llegamos. Yo creo que Omar, Omar buqueó la semana completa para nosotros. Hizo un trabajo increíble, Omar. O sea, de verdad que, que tremendo trabajo. Shout out. Pero en Shout esta out. ocasión cambiamos de location. No hay coincidencia que Bank of America esté ahí. Y es posible porque este coro, estos jóvenes que estamos acá, todos somos trading inversionistas. Probablemente en algún momento le hemos quitado algún, algún dólar en un trade a, a Warren Buffett. <ríe> Pero en esta ocasión tenemos un trader que todos conocen. Es un trader del mundo de opciones, del stock market. Yo creo que por eso también para nosotros tiene un respeto. Eh, un respeto porque conocemos su trayectoria. Y de igual manera, es de nuestra industria. O sea, es difícil en Estados Unidos conseguir buenos traders solamente de opciones o de stocks. Y, y para nosotros es un honor tenerlo acá. Este podcast va a ser grabado totalmente en inglés. Yo me imagino que Omar, de una manera u otra, va a buscar la manera de que o tenga una traducción y lo subamos en inglés y en español, o tenga subtítulos. Pero sé que va a ser un podcast que va a edificar tu vida como trader, también como emprendedor. Y algo muy importante, Winston, en ese mismo intro, Ajá. que es muy importante para ti que quizás no hablas inglés, que veas este podcast. Porque una cosa es la comunidad de trading latina que tiene mucho para ofrecer. Pero también en Estados Unidos, primero, una cultura totalmente diferente. Se ve el mercado diferente y el mercado está en Estados Unidos. Soy yes, bueno sir. primero conocer traders exitosos que están aquí y ver cómo ellos operan en el mercado. Yo vi a Nuber esta mañana tradeando. Y la forma en la que él hablaba en el pre-market era bien significativa. <risa> no, no, no el 3 de mañana fue como Lewis Hamilton. Exacto. O sea, fue segundos y he, he was out. So, guys, espero que disfruten ese podcast e iniciamos. No, thank you for the opportunity. We really appreciate this time with you and we hope you enjoy this, this podcast as well. Yeah, I so. really appreciate you guys having me. It's definitely the great to finally bring it together in Miami. Do you understand the intro? Or? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to understand it after. <laughs> gotcha. How you been in DR? Let's start from there. Yeah, yeah. I've been in DR a few times. My first time was when I was 18 and okay. I absolutely loved it. I just haven't been in the city and get to enjoy and see the different lifestyle. I've, I've just been to like Punta Cana, like the normal stuff. Yeah. So so Punta Cana is what's the place that you remember the most from DR? But have you been in the city, like in Santo Domingo? No, no. But my girl's from... Uh, From the city, so like oh. I'm not, sh I'm not sure for where. You get it? Is yeah. Dominican? Yeah, yeah, she's hey, Dominican. Hey, señores, Dominican power. That's <laughs> everywhere. We are get in everywhere. The get in the traders. <laughs> yeah. yeah. What What do you have for us today? Noor, I know you're from New Jersey, so I want to kind of hear a little bit about like growing up north. You know, cold weather, really close to the markets. The Nasdaq is right across the street. S&P 500, everything is just across the bridge. Mm -hmm. So how was that? Like, how do you get to the market? How do you get close to it? Because uh, you know, I know, it, it, sorry, because I know you started like pretty, pretty young yeah. in the market. How do you open your first investment account if you weren't even like an I, adult? I, I opened it under my dad. Like a lot of people always <laughs> ask me that, how did you open an account? I just open it on, it's normal. Like as a kid, just ask your dad, you open up your account. And I ended up opening an account under my dad when I was 16. So that's like, what, seven years ago, back in 2016. You're 23. You're pretty young. Correct, that's pretty yeah. cool. So, yeah, it was dope. I mean, New Jersey, you know, it's 10 minutes away from New York. So if I want to go to New York, I can go to New York. Um, but when I was 16, I, uh, I used to take the subway and, and train to New York. So it was right there. I know you did an ownership with an investment bank. How did that play out? Like, how, how do you get there? What did you see that really caught your attention? Because at 16, like I think about myself back then and... I, I was playing video games. Yeah, I was playing time. video games. Yeah. Like, I didn't really have the mindset to like, oh, I want to go ahead and do this. Like, sure. I had dreams, but I was really far from like thinking about executing them at 16. So for sure. <laughs> I mean, like, honestly, it was probably one of the best experiences I've ever had. One, just just being in that environment and, and just exposing yourself to a different environment, being different, seeing different things and, you know, being able to 
you know, finally kind of grow up as a kid. I was taking the train and, and, and then, the, you know, the subway to work every day uh, for three months straight. I was I was I was only 16. I was like a sophomore in high school. So it was definitely great. Obviously, going to the office in the morning, you had to be on time. So it was growing up quick. And just seeing how it worked, right? Back then, the Wolf of Wall Street. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. You know right what I mean? So it was definitely like, you know, You were insane. a suit back then? Yeah, yeah. yeah to the a, office? Yeah, yeah. With, with tie and everything? Yeah, I would come literally with a tie. I still have pictures on my Instagram when we used to go to work every day where a suit used to be so hot in the subway. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 it definitely was an experience, though. Obviously, some days it sucked because how hot it was in the summer. But, but for the most part, I learned a lot. And just being around successful people just brought a different light to my eyes. You mentioned The Wolf of Wall Street. Like, you're 16. This mm. epic movie comes out. You're in the market. Like, how did that impact you? Like, how, how do you saw that movie and what do you think afterwards? Honestly, it was crazy watching that movie. Just I was like, ah, <laughs> I want to be there one day. Obviously, <laughs> obviously, not all the things going on in yeah, that movie, yeah. you know, but doing the right things. right? Exactly. Yeah. And, and just enjoying life. You know what I mean? That was really what it was when I watched that movie. And I could watch that movie over and over again as a kid. Uh, you know, even nowadays, I could watch that every now and then. So. Uh, it was definitely an experience watching that and then being able to see it on Wall Street. And yeah, a lot of the things that I saw in the movie happened in the office. They would come in the morning from, you know, straight from the club. Sometimes <laughs> it was insane. But yeah, it was cool. What, what was the difference between trading for yourself and trading for an institution? You know, obviously I wasn't trading at 16. I was just there watching everybody learning mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Basically, you know, just just learning, you know, taking my path. But the difference I saw was more of like, it's your freedom. You know what I mean? Trading from home, you get to choose, you know, to wake up and go to your, you know, office in your house and, and trade. And then at that office, you had to be on time every day. You know, uh, there were days where, you know, the, we had team meetings, you know, getting yelled at and stuff like that. But for sure, it was, it was, a, it's definitely a big difference as far as like what you're in control of. Cause when you're in the office, you're, You're subject to do something certain you know everybody had or every department has to do something different right as you being a trader at home you know you're an options trader or i'm an options trader for example and you know i choose what i want to do for the day in the office you don't get to really choose you're in charge of something and you have to complete it and when you say in charge of something meaning like oh you have to do commodities and then like you have to do this commodity and that's yeah. your job to trade that specific commodity correct correct Or yeah yeah that's what i mean and, and it's not there's no money goal obviously i'm just saying as far as like for for example for us like i'm an options trader if i want to try futures out i can go ahead and try futures out it's not like they can do that you know what i mean um and also you still have a boss when you work on wall street even though you make that type of money you still have someone you have to report to and you know make sure you handle things on you know the right occasions or someone's going to come to you and, and ask you about it That's pretty dope to hear yeah. that from someone who's been inside. So how do you place targets? We all know the market is unpredictable. Right. But and for example, if you work at Pepsi, you have a target to grow sales mm -hmm. 10% a year. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to trading, you cannot just say, hey, the team has to have an average return of 10% today. How flexible? Are you pursuing goals and targets when you were working as an investment banker? And also, do you feel do you feel the pressure of working of working on a place like that? Yeah, because I know you were in trading, but you were seeing the traders yeah. like getting this pressure and like as Ernesto mentions, like following those goals that are set up. Yeah, there there was definitely pressure, and 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 it was a lot different because. For example, like I wasn't making any trades because obviously you need licenses, but we had to handle other things like certain phone calls, um, you know, note things mm -hmm. down when they're doing things and, and, and make sure that, you know, things are documented. We were in charge of like, you know, simple things, but we definitely had to complete them or there would be an issue at the end of the day. Right. Well, there was there was things that we had to complete every single day other than trading. Do you think you're a, be a better trader than your first boss? Yeah, I knew how much he was, <laughs> I knew how much he was making a month, and it was actually insane. Uh, knowing that back then, I know he was making at the time uh, about one hundred twenty thousand a month, one hundred thirty thousand dollars a month. He was making that. Yeah, he was yeah, making that's a that. Lot, and yeah. for me, as a sixteen year old, no, that was crazy. That for was you, crazy, I mean. bro. I'm hearing one hundred thirty thousand. I'm like, nah, no way. <laughs> So, and, and nowadays that's how much I spend a month, you know, uh, okay. <laughs> 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 yeah. 
I, I'm not. I don't really have that relationship with uh, the office anymore, or or the people in the office. You know, it just we parted ways, and uh, you know, some miscommunication between the both of us. But yeah, it, it's cool to see that path and then this path. You know, it's it's mm-hmm. when you get when people get to the market, it happened to me. You don't really know what you're gonna trade, and I was lucky enough. So as I told you, we Avacus, we we show the market to Latin Americans or foreigners in general who speak Spanish and we bring them into the market. We first introduce them to stocks, then we introduce them to options because we think that's the way, not only for day trading, but like value investing, swing trading, yeah, portfolio, oh, yeah, portfolio management, right. everything. And then you get to options. So for me, I was a student before I was a part of the team. And then I had a structure on how to get to market. You did too. Hmm. But why options within all these different instruments that you can trade? Like so, how do you get to options? First of all, honestly, I started with shares in the first place. Like even in even when I was doing the internship, I didn't get to see the options department. I was I, I only saw shares being traded. Okay. Um, and then after, obviously, I, I did my own research and, and started seeing different things. You know, futures, trade uh, options. Um, and then I ended up choosing options. Uh, after a while, I was still like, uh, for example, when I was interning, I wasn't really trading on my own. I only had like a couple shares of certain stocks holding long term. And then Which when I, one? Do yeah, you remember? Uh, yeah, I had at the time Micron Technology, okay. Square, nice. uh, you know, Apple, just, you know, stocks that everybody knew about Microsoft. Mm-hmm. But like I said, it was only like a couple shares of each. It wasn't, a, it, I only had like a couple thousand in there, $3,000, $4,000, something like that. That was your starting capital, $4,000? Uh, I would say at the beginning for my long-term investments, you know, mm-hmm. every time I made money, I would just throw a couple, uh, a couple a hundred couple dollars, hundred, 200, yeah, 300. Three, two, three hundred dollars. And I would just buy a share just so I could say that I'm invested. Um, and then my dad always told me to invest into the stock market. So I invested. That's pretty cool yeah. that he had that like vision of you going to the sure. market since you were young. So options. How was that first options trade? Because I remember mines. I, I think I told you earlier today, I made 250 and I was like, damn, this is what I'm doing forever. Like, <laughs> doesn't matter how long it takes me. I'm going to learn how to manage. Yeah, because Jan was a Uber. So I used to he drive has Uber to work like, like 10 hours, something yeah. like that to get the money. So, so for me, first day was crazy for him. It was, I was mind blown. I was like, damn, like I just did this sitting from this chair. Like I remember, I, I, bef- I if I remember correctly, it was like Moderna or you know, Inovio. Inovio. Pharmaceuticals. Yeah. Ino. You know, yeah, I you know, and I did that trade. I bought a contract four hundred ninety four dollars. I made two hundred fifty one in return. I didn't know what what I was doing, but I saw that I was a hundred dollars up like really quick. <laughs> and now that I think about it, I could have sold that trade within like a few minutes with the same profit, and I just let it run. And the teta was killing me all day. But how how do you feel with that first trade? Was it a positive one? Did you lose it? I think my first options trade was on like Netflix or something. Netflix? (laughs) And I made like $20 or $40, something like that. And I remember taking a screenshot. I feel like if I go on my phone, I can probably. I have mine. It was on Robin. I have mine. Yeah, I think I have mine as well. Um, And it was cool because I sent it to my, my, my parents in a group chat. And, you know, they, they, they were like, cool. You know what I mean? They don't really understand it. But I, I think my first ever profit was like 20 or, or $20 or $40. I don't know exactly. but And back then, fees were like $10 yeah. each way. I was on Robinhood, though. I think oh, it was free the okay. whole time. Okay. So I wasn't paying anything. So. There was a day trade on Robinhood? Yeah, I started on But this is before everybody started using Robinhood. So what the when I used Robinhood, nobody even knew what that was. Even my dad was scared that I was using that. He was like... Do we, do you trust them? Do you, have you done the research? And then I searched it up. They were, you know, uh, protected by the FDIC and so I did my research. You know what I mean? So that's 2018, 2017. I think it was 2017. Yeah. Wow. 2017. But that's crazy that your dad, like, ask you those questions yeah. because like, it he means knew about he the market. Knew. Like yeah, he, he knew, knew about the market. Yeah. So, but so Robin Hood was so new too. Yeah. My dad was a salesman for Toyota for like 15 years straight. And as he was working, same thing like me, like, but I was, I was doing it on a smaller scale, a couple of, he was probably doing the same thing, but he had 15 years of leverage ahead of me. So he would just buy a couple shares of Apple. Uh, what else was he invested in? Apple, you know, Microsoft, things that everybody kind of knows of. Yes. Yeah. Uh, blue chips. Yeah. Blue chip stocks. And, and, and he was just investing over the years as he was working, maybe like Every time he gets a check, probably put a hundred. I don't know exactly. I never really got to see his portfolio. I just knew he had a long-term portfolio that he, it was basically his safe haven and he would just let it grow over the years. 
Do you have a portfolio or do you just day trade? Currently, I don't, but I did have a portfolio pretty okay. pretty good. You plan on building one or staying cash? So I'm staying cash right now just because we have elections coming up in November. Okay. I want to see what goes on there. And then after there, I'll, I'll, I'll choose the route of, you know, which stocks I want to invest in. I know we're going to talk about this later, but the moment just came. You just said you don't invest for the long term in stocks because you are all cash now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But... You're a huge investor in real estate. Correct. And historically, stocks have done better than any other asset class. For sure. And you've seen Apple grow 50% a year for mm -hmm. the past 10 years. Mm -hmm. And you're making a lot of cash flow. When you understand interest, compound interest, I'm sure if you take 20% of all your cash flow and you set a time horizon of 15 years, you can end up with probably $150 million. So why don't start with the compound interest now that you are 23? So I, I was doing that for about four years, right? So when I was making money day trading, I would throw it into the stocks that I believed in. I was also one of the, I don't want to actually say that, but I was a very heavy believer of Tesla. Okay. Before the split, before you anything. were not yeah, anymore. I was in at hundred and eighty dollars before okay. split, oh, and you got to remember crazy. this thing went over split, two thousand yeah, yeah. dollars, and then yeah, it yeah. went up to a thousand Correct. something. Yeah, second so, split. Yeah. So I was I was in deep, and I, I was using margin at the time. And the market, you got to remember, was going up every year, every year, every year from twenty seventeen. Obviously, we had some hiccups, trade you know, uh, trade talks with China, all that stuff with with Trump, but mm -hmm. all those pullbacks ended up being better opportunities for me to put more money in and more money in. So I was doing that and then I ended up finding a good exit and I, I took what I had, right? And I, I made a you know a, a decent amount off of that. And then I started putting money into different areas so that I don't have all my money into one basket. Of now course. as far as stocks, do I believe that's one of the best investments that I can make? A hundred percent. Is it, do I believe it's better than for me to invest into real estate? Yes. But also I might be a little biased because I, I've been trading stocks and, and, and not investing into real estate. That's like also going to someone who does real estate and saying, what would you invest in real estate or S&P 500? He's going to say real estate. Yeah. Right. Of course. Of course. So I, I trust the stock market a lot more than I trust the, the real estate industry just because of what I was, you know, basically, you know, raised into as far as like getting involved into. And then. Obviously, I wanted to kind of be a bigger, you know, investor. So I started putting money into the real estate. And how do you get started in real estate? Who's who was your mentor there? So Grant Cardone. No. <laughs> <laughs> Grant Cardone is definitely, you know, up there. But I never got to learn from him or anything like that. Uh, I have a few big friends, you know, billionaires, uh, multimillionaires. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's dope because I get to have those conversations with them and see what they do and and you know, I, I can ask them, Hey, what should I invest into? Do you have any projects for me? And they might, they might be working on their own $250 million project and they're taking investments for it. Right. For example, uh, a really great uh, opportunity that I had about a year ago was, uh, you know, a, a very big project in Jersey city in New Jersey. And I was able to invest, you know, it was close to like a half a million dollars. Um, and it was about 25% a year. Okay. Um, that's yeah. Nice. So that's really good as yeah. far as, you know, return. So I have, I have mentors as in friends that do different things. It's, it's almost like if your friends came up to you and asked you, you know, how to start trading. Yeah. I had, I have friends in different industry and that I can go to and be like, Hey, do you have anything in Texas that I can invest to into or anything in Utah I can invest to? And you know, they would help me. So how are you invested right now? Like how, how, how diversified yeah, how diversified are you right now so i have about 16 uh you know rental properties right now you're uh, doing good man <laughs> yeah it, it's all right uh i definitely want to be in the hundreds you know one day obviously and that's like the, that's the big goal you know when i have these conversations with these multi-millionaires and billionaires they'll talk about how they have you know 200 units or whatever you know section eight Right. And I want to get into that. And, and, and right now I'm just slowly, you know, buying a house every two months, every three months. And obviously if things go bad in the economy, I'm in a good position where I can still make the payments. And, and if anything goes bad, I, I'm still in a comfortable spot. I'm not fully devoting all my money into one basket. Yeah. yeah you, and yeah. you're out of funded, right? You have a very good quality of cash flow every month. So yeah, I was just thinking right. about that. Yeah. Like you have, a, how do you handle cash flow? Because 
as a day trader, that's that's the thing that I like the most. Like you're in the market and you're making cash every day. Correct. So if you have good, you know, risk management, you're going to live in the market. Yeah. How, how does that go for you? So for me, I saw your blog, by the way. What did it end, ended up being? Oh, how spending. much I spent? I spent almost f like four hundred thousand. Four hundred. Yeah, almost yeah. four hundred thousand. You need to spend that money for. Task, uh, yeah, so, that too. Know. Obviously, I can go and buy something that yeah, has yeah, yeah, value, a watch or something <laughs> like that. But I do like to have fun. And uh, the best thing about trading, like you said, is the capital. I like to split it. I have, I have, uh, you know, a curriculum for myself where I want to twenty percent here, twenty percent here. Mm -hmm. I also uh, invest into other companies. I also have other companies that I'm working on as of right now. Where it's not just about the stock market. So when people see these vlogs and they see that I'm doing all these different things. It's not all about the stock market. You know, I have hundreds really of other smart. things. Yeah, you know what I mean? So, like, that money can be used to be bigger and better. And it, it puts less pressure on trading because I've now other businesses making me money. Yeah. You know, we're speaking I mean? about that today that, like, the market pays. But if you build a good business, of course, it's probably going to pay you even better than, yeah. so, than the bro, market. I have one question for you. How, how do you get educated, Wait. not in trading, uh, in stop. life? 6 p.m. Do you? I'm good. I'm good. Oh, good. good? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Because you are doing good in real estate. You are doing good in the stock market. You have a couple of businesses. Girl. Dominican <laughs> girl. <laughs> <laughs> But you're only 23. <laughs> yeah. How do you get educated? And how come somebody who started doing good, doing options, trading options, making thousands of dollars every day, how do you stay true to yourself? And you, humble at the same humble, time because you're yeah. very humble, man. Yeah, I have like, to tell you that like we met this morning, we picked you up at the airport, and you came with the like super nice vibe. What's up, guys? You know, made twelve thousand dollars. Yeah, like we traded. Seconds. You made cash, and it's like you feel like a friend. You know, yeah, yeah. we've met a lot of people, and the best traders are like that, mm -hmm. but also the best people because yeah, money sure. can really like dull your vision. Hundred percent, hundred percent. And I've definitely ran into people where you know. I would even have more money than them, but they would have money and the way that they talk to other people, I just don't even want to be part of that. Like the same way I treat anybody is the way I treat, you know, someone who's a millionaire, a billionaire. It doesn't matter about status to me. Uh, for me, it's just like a respect thing and, and, and just sticking to discipline. And, and he just asked, like, how do I really, you know, just stick to my core, you know, beliefs. And, and, and honestly, I just haven't changed anything since, you know, before I had money, you know what I mean? And I just stick to the same discipline. I schedule my weeks, schedule my months, stay on top of things. And once you get comfortable, you get comfortable things, things that it took me seven years to get to this point. You won't see that decline until a couple years after. Like when we say, yo, look behind us and we start looking at all the times we went through things and, and all the throwbacks and how much we work. The same thing could happen on the downward trend. We could go right back to that. So I would never want to go back to that. So I stay on top of my things. Maybe you, maybe you stop working, you stop working hard. You might not see it in a month or in two months, but I promise you in a year or two, you'll see how fast, you know, your life can go right back to, yeah, to the old that ways. That is true. It's funny that you say that because we also in Abacus try to, to stay healthy, st Correct. stay working out, uh, reading books every day. And I would like to know how, how's a day in your life like? How how do you divide every actions in your day? So I, I I divide my days into block times. For example, I'll scratch out. You know, I, I wake up at 7 a.m. I go for a mile run. Uh, I'll be done by you know I wake up at seven. I don't start running till 7:30. Uh, I'll be done by 8 a.m. Go back, shower, and then I'll start trading at 9 a.m. Eastern time. That's if I'm on the East Coast, obviously. And then, you know, I'm done trading by, I scratch off from nine to 11 just in case I'm at the desk too long. Mm -hmm. So nine to 11, if I finish early, I finish early, I get to sit by myself. And then 11 a.m. I go to the gym. And then, you know, the rest of the day is scheduled into, you know, a, a 30 minutes of reading to an hour. I range it. It's not like strictly an hour a day I have to read. I work out every day, like every single day. You know what I mean? And you were uh, doing pushes yeah, <laughs> like yeah, yeah. a few minutes ago. Like that was crazy. <laughs> We don't need here. To, and the thing is, like, people don't understand that working out isn't just <laughs> going to the gym. You can literally handle what you need to do at home, jumping jacks, sure. just staying active. Yeah. And I and what people don't understand is when they watch my vlogs and stuff and I go to the clubs and I'm enjoying life, mm -hmm. I don't drink. It might look like I drink alcohol and I smoke and all that stuff. And it perceives because they want to assume that. But I don't even drink or smoke. 
And based on social media and how people look at me, they're probably like, yeah, he's drinking, he's smoking. I don't do any of that. So I just keep the same, you know, mindset that I had before. I'm not going to change things just because, you know, I have some money now. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. It's the same with us. Like we don't drink, uh, we don't smoke. Like we try to, to, to stay in a place where we felt like focus, really focus. No, yeah. And also it's really hard for you to, and focus is the word. As soon as you start pu putting in small distractions, that mm -hmm. can build up like pretty fast. You know, a question I want to ask you is when you start making money, there's that like first purchase that you make that you feel scared of. <laughs> that you're like, okay, I'm going to do this, but do like. I deserve this? Yeah, like. You, you need a little kick in. The yeah, back that you're here. like, okay, I, it's not that I can afford it, but I can like make it happen and then I'll deal with it. What was that for you? Si este podcast está agregando valor a tu vida, suscríbete, dale like y compártelo. Es la manera como nos ayudas con el algoritmo a que podamos seguir expandiendo este contenido a personas como tú. De igual manera, si quieres aprender sobre psicología del trading, day trading y portafolio, estás en el lugar correcto. En un link en el description o en el caption de este video vas a tener toda la información para acceder a nuestra plataforma de educación gratuita. Bendiciones, nos vemos pronto. Bro, honestly, it's crazy that you bring that up, but I have a vlog on my YouTube channel the f when I went to go buy my McLaren. Yeah. Okay. I was shaking <laughs> <laughs> because I was so young that they didn't let me finance the car. And my plan was, all right, I'm going to put down, you know, $100,000 down and pay it monthly. There's nothing wrong with financing. That's how you live life. It's That's how you sure, of course. People think if you're not buying things cash, you, bro, it doesn't make sense, bro. Like people don't understand. That's, not, don't that's not what rich people do. And I'm not saying about me. I'm, I'm talking about billionaires. Yeah, yeah. They they take debt to grow themselves and, and grow their prop, um, investments, right? That's why people use margin and, and when they leverage. buy properties, you it's just, just need leverage. To, you yeah. need to see the, the war debt chart. Exactly. It's, like, it's huge. Yeah, know? and even it's the cash flow matter. Like if you have $400,000 and you can give $100,000 and then pay it out, you still have $300,000 to make it rain. So, exactly. like, so you went to, to buy the McLaren and what happened? And they, they the first day I'm talking to them, I'm thinking <laughs> I'm going to be able to finance. They're calling the banks. They came back and said, I'm too young and I have to buy the, ca the, the car outright. And banks don't trust traders. Like you can yeah, that's true. make $500,000, um, report that to the IRS here. Mm -hmm. uh, banks don't see that as a recurring income. So yeah. they don't lend you money. Especially day difficult. traders. The long-term yeah. investments, they're okay with because they look at it as an investment. Yeah. So if yeah. you're holding things for a year And they plus, take your portfolio as collateral. Correct, yeah. correct. And uh, so I ended up having to pay it outright, obviously not cash. It's a, it's, a, it's a bank check, which is technically cash, right? When someone says that you went and go pay cash for a car, that's what they mean. Yeah, yeah. So I ended up coming in with the check and I'm, I keep looking at the check. I'm like, how do much? I really want to do this right now? Uh, it was 290,000. That was like uh, almost all your money in that time or a huge part of your-, of your What percentage? No, 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 no. I, I think at that time I probably had about, you know, two to $3 million. dollars. Oh, okay, it 10%. was a good buy then. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean, it still was scary though because it's like my first time purchasing <laughs> something big and I'm like, should I do it? Should I not? And I'm, I'm there. Like I'm supposed to pick up the car right now and I'm over here debating. I have to sign the papers. So it's right before I'm signing the papers. I'm asking my friends, yo, is this, should I do this? I feel like I'm buying a... a what were you driving How, how did you get that car insured? Oh, uh, yo, it was expensive. It was $1,100 a month. Sometimes insurers don't want to... Correct. For people so young yeah what were you driving before so i had an m4 cs okay that, which is definitely a great car it was one actually one of still one of my favorite top top three cars i ever had um i always wanted an m and i ended up walking in and getting an m4 cs below retail price this is before the covid prices all those car prices that jump um but yeah that's the car i had but which was a big jump because that car i paid like ninety six thousand dollars for okay so you're talking about two hundred thousand dollars more for yeah. a car so you sign what yeah. how do you feel it was a relief because now it's like too late it's whatever <laughs> happened, happened. You know, i'm signing the papers and he's like all right let me come show you the car and it's all on video i ended up walking down the ribbon on the car it was definitely a great feeling did sure. anything change after you got the mclaren did anything change uh I mean, a lot of people notice you on a, on a daily basis because they don't even care who's in the car. They're just recording the car. So when I'm in at a red light, I just look to my left and people are recording and stuff like that. But other than like like life itself, nah. Daring life. Yeah, my daily life didn't change. It was just... Da dating life. 
Yeah, yeah. My no, dating, dating life. life. <laughs> dating life. Did it change? No, no, it didn't change. It didn't change. Uh, it definitely was motivation, though, every day. Getting yeah. to walk up to my car and, and, and hearing it start and stuff like that. How's your relationship with your family? Like, uh, for me, it's uh, awesome to see you at 23, a millionaire, entrepreneur, investor, trader. But how do you share that with your family? Do you share that with your family? That's a question as well. And along that same line, I was really surprised that when you came this morning, you told me that you were up in Jersey visiting your brother yeah. that was going to college. So that, that was like, damn, that's pretty cool that... See, like he flew to Jersey, then came down to Miami just because yeah. he wanted to see his brother. So, not yet. I think family is very important. Um, having a relationship with your parents. Obviously, people go through, you know, ups and downs with their family. And I of think course. over time, as we grow and, and become adults, it, it's it's definitely something to mature and just like solve it. You know what I mean? Sit down and, and handle it. As far as me, I've always had a great relationship. So, uh, you know, I've never been through the ups and downs. Obviously, I had very strict uh, parents growing yeah. up. I'm, I'm, my parents are immigrants, so. Uh, I'm <laughs> also a Muslim, so you know, just growing up, just things were, were 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 really strict. So obviously, I couldn't do things that my friends were doing growing up. Uh, but yeah, I have a great relationship with my parents. I tell them basically I, as much as I can. And that builds on character on you. Excuse like, me. That builds on character on you, like yeah, yeah, of course. And then obviously, my brother is the most important thing in my life. You know, uh, I look at him and be like, that's like, you know, that's the success of me. Even though I'm only like six years older than him. But, you know, his success matters more than me. So whatever he needs and whatever he needs to do for the rest of his life, I'm going to be there for him. So. How does he see you? Like, uh, because if, if he's what, like 17? He's 18. He just turned 18. Literally like a couple yeah, of years ago. Let's like, let's set it straight. Like you're really big within the industry. Like most young kids around his age probably know you. Because yeah. I, I've noticed that every kid now, like at least in here is different. But in Latin America now, like. Training is just like getting going. Like Insane. in here, it's been for a while, but now Latin America is like every kid wants to trade. Like we've had kids that are 13 years old mm -hmm. going to our office with their parents. Like this is what he wants to do. So like I'm gonna just set him up for success, you know? For sure. So how do you think he sees you? I mean, you're his brother. It's different, but like yeah, I mean, I don't really have those talks with him. Obviously, it's just like my little brother, and I'm <laughs> his big brother. But obviously, you know, he 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 probably looks at me as like, you know, something that, you know, that makes him work harder. I feel like that's motivation for him. He trades? Uh, yo, he traded one summer. Uh, he made about 30,000 and oh, like, shit. He, he spent 17,000 on a Rolex. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but he ended up trying to trade during school and then it was affecting his grades. So my mom said no more trading for him. <laughs> so it's cool because I didn't get to finish school. So he'll get to finish school, not focus on trading, don't have to worry about money obviously and you mean school as a as high school or like college college I okay, college. okay, okay. Uh, i dropped out my first year okay so yeah i mean he's gonna get to finish i'm gonna be there for that and make sure you know he becomes a doctor i was supposed to be a doctor so is that something that you would like to do still like going to school or not yeah so one day i want to go back after i'm all done with this and it's just straight strictly residual income in my life i want to go back and just educate myself just to educate myself not not to get a degree or nothing like that just to really just you know, be educated and, and, and learn a lot more because originally I was going to become a doctor and I was devoting my life to that and, yeah. and I was going to the 6 a.m. tutoring and, and all that good stuff. So I uh, definitely want to go back probably in my 30s. I'll go back to school. Uh, a lot of people go back to this, go back to school old, you know, and there's yeah, nothing yeah. wrong with that. For sure. So Noor, why become a public person when you could be a silent millionaire, um, especially during this age? Uh, you have some setbacks because of your public life, but why decide to, to go public? So going public wasn't even my choice, honestly. I was like 18 and like my best friend at the time, uh, he, he, he's also the one that helped me get the internship because his brother worked on Wall Street. That's how I got the internship. Okay. He was like, yo, you gotta, you gotta, you know, open up a Discord chat. And at the time there was no Discord chats. It was very little education online. And I honestly don't like talking to the cameras like, Obviously, it sounds like I'm confident on the camera, but I'm not really a fan of this. Like, I, I, I do it because I like meeting new people and networking and just meeting, you know, good people. But in reality, I'm not really someone that likes talking to the camera. Uh, and it was very hard for me at the beginning to kind of get used to that. And the reason I became public with it is I was already doing it on a daily basis. So I was like, why don't I open up a Discord chat and trade live with people? Because I'm already waking up and trading live no matter what. So it's just one added 
thing to my day and it's not going to affect the course of my day. Did you see that as a business or did it become a business? At the beginning, it was more of like building a community, bro. Like it was, it was cool just hearing other people's opinion on the market on a daily basis and seeing how they felt about certain things, like asking, well, what are you looking at today? Right. And then they'll ask you what you're looking at for today. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that was the original plan. And then it turned into something bigger than that. And, uh, you know, large community now. How many, how many members do you have? Uh, almost 2000 members. Nice. Yeah. Nice. So it's growing fast then. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it, it's just like, you know, I don't promote it and I don't, I, cause trading is not easy. You know, I don't, I don't That's like, true. I don't like people think that you can just yeah. start trading. You're going to be profitable. I don't like promoting it on my, on my story. If people repost me after making money, then I repost it, but I don't, you know, hop on social media and be like, Hey guys, join my chat today. You'll make $500, blah, blah, blah. I don't do stuff like that. We we follow. Good thing that you're saying that because we follow the same line. Like even to our students, we tell them like, "Hey, you're le taking this course. You're learning the markets, but don't be fool. You're not getting out of here a millionaire. Like that's sure. not gonna happen. You're gonna learn the basis of the market because the market has a particular thing. It's really hard for you to learn it in a structured way." If someone doesn't teach it to you, there's so much information that is really hard to grasp. So it's it's uh, it makes me happy that you follow the same philosophy yeah. or that we follow the same philosophy because I see a lot of people in the internet making it sound like trading is really easy. Yeah, you, you gotta reach be, quick. Yeah, yeah, you have to be willing to like put yourself in the fire, literally, if and you fail to. a lot of yeah. time. What was your yeah. biggest failure? I want to add to that. It's like, bro, I was gonna become a doctor. Right. And how many school, how many years of school did I have to go through? 10, Obviously, 12, I, yeah, yeah, bro. I, I went to school for one year out of that was like 20 percent or 10 percent of what I actually yeah. needed to do. Right. And that's to make two hundred fifty thousand a year. People come into the trading industry and it's like, all right, I got two, three thousand dollars. Let's see how much I can make. Two hundred fifty K a year and go for that. This right? guy right here tells our students the same thing. Like you go to college for four years to then try to figure it out what you're going to do. Correct. So mm -hmm. how do you expect to come here? And after eight, 12, 16, 20 weeks, make it happen. Like if you dedicate yourself the same four years yeah. that you're going to give college, like if you put them and it's not don't go to college, but like if you yeah. follow the same methodology, if you go for four years, you learn, you're going to become good at the market. Right. Like you're going to. Mm -hmm. So, so Noor, what do you think about the psychology of trading? Is Say that again, I'm sorry. Psychology of trading. Oh, okay. What do you think about that aspect in trading? I think it's a very important factor of trading, right? Um, you know, psychology, you know, it, anything can affect, you know, your psychology on a daily basis. Not, nonetheless, adding trading to your day and, and, and dealing with a loss. How are you going to respond to a loss? Are you, the next trade you're going to take, you're going to go all in and, and risk your whole portfolio. Yeah, like revenge trading. Yeah, and, and that's all, all psychology because that's all subconscious things going on in, the, in your brain. Because every time someone takes a big loss, they're like, they're asking themselves, why didn't they have a stop loss mm -hmm. and that's all subconscious things. Mm -hmm. And that all deals with psychology. Right. And people don't understand that's all psychology, whether they don't want to hear it. Cause obviously hearing the word psychology and like, you know, talking about it, people don't want to hear that. They're like, all right, I want to get to technical analysis. Right. But psychology is a real thing, right? Your brain works every millisecond of the day. And you may not think that you're thinking of something and you're actually thinking of something. So you have that's to train true. your brain on a yep. daily basis to follow certain things like discipline is part of your psychology. How are you looking at things? Are you, are you, are you being strict on your stop loss? That's part of your discipline and your psychology. Right? So I think it's either number, two, it's probably the number one factor when it comes to trading. I'm glad that you say that because that's part of my philosophy in trading. Like even that, um, we are really good uh, technical analysts and also day traders, but I think the best part of the way we teach to the people how to trade in the stock market is first you need to build a portfolio, then you need to learn the fundamentals and the technical. But if you don't have the psychology aspect, it's, it's almost impossible that you can make it in this career. Correct. Yeah, how do you, you break the barrier of first trading options with 50K to go and trade 500K? <laughs> even uh, one million, yeah. even one million, because you, you, I, I have seen trades that you put in the market, like $1 million on, with contracts. Yeah. That's crazy. Don't remind me. <laughs> <laughs> that must be really stressful. Uh, like, how do you scale? 
the mentality. Honestly, honestly, it just it, before we even talk about scaling, that was probably the most stressful time of my life. It's just, difficult. Yeah. Hell, for like, how long did you, you do that? that? Or how many? Yeah. Three months. Three months. Yeah. Um, and I honestly couldn't take it anymore. I, yeah. Like, like straight up, I, I literally couldn't take it. I started noticing different things. My hands are a little, sh you know, shaky, shaking even yeah. after the market. It's almost like I take pre-workout. Oh my god, that's um, self-awareness. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and with options, you can burn like a hundred thousand dollars, put it in a million, like really quick, nah, like within yeah. a minute. Right away. You yeah. could probably have like even more oh, than my, that. My P and L was moving like twenty thousand dollars every second per and per and like bro, dollar. Like, ev not even a dollar. Like literally every second. My P and L was moving fifteen, twenty thousand dollars. That's crazy. Yeah, That's and, crazy. and, and it's That's crazy. too much risk. <laughs> too much risk. Yeah, and I'm telling you, like straight up, I'm not ready for that. And now, now, am I going to be ready for that one day? Probably. But the the type of stress that I dealt with and 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 scaling into that, I I'm maybe it was just me doing it too fast. Like I said, we yeah. tell people don't scale in too fast. Obviously, don't up your you know the amount you put into a trade too quickly because then you'll end up blowing because you're not ready for that stop loss. For me. I was still profitable. It was just the fact that the amount of stress I was dealing with, I couldn't do certain things in my life, whether that's like going to the gym after, or, you know, I would take a nap after, and I don't like naps. I don't take naps on a daily, like, I don't I, take naps. Me and the money. Yeah, right. <laughs> you don't do that. Do that. <laughs> but realistically, really, I, I, I like on, a, on like real life right now, I only probably take a nap like once, once a month, rarely. No. What's your monthly target? Uh, profit exactly. monthly target. Good question. Yeah. So what's crazy is I don't have a monthly profit. You just go for it. No, I I just trade to you know I focus. You go with the flow. Yeah, I, I focus on risk management and, and you know whatever comes with that comes with that, and that's my number one factor when it comes to trading my risk management. Because if you focus on your risk management, you're gonna end up green at the end of the month as long as you're you know right more than fifty percent of the time. But you could also see someone with forty percent win loss you know, ratio and end up being green yeah. for them. Yeah. 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 Right. It's just, it's just dependent on your risk versus reward. Mm -hmm. I saw mm -hmm. you had a really tight stop loss today when we traded together. Correct. And you said yeah. like 20 cents. And I, when I heard it, because I take a, li a little bit more risk. Correct. But for me, it was like, shit, he has a really tight. I, I, I think that's stop the loss. way you uh, like calculate your your risk. Right. Because yeah. with options, it's different. You 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 cannot say I'm going to uh, like sell the the contract when um the 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 trade goes minus 20 percent or 10 percent mm -hmm. you need to put cents in Correct. the trade right yeah it's really that's, hard to calculate that's why it's so plus. how i do it is before i even start my day i always i already know where i'm going to get in and where i'm going to get out if things don't go my way and i also know where i'm going to get out if it goes my way Right. So like before the market even opened, I told you where I was going to get out if yeah. things didn't go my way. And, and if things go my way, um, my two dollar target as far as the drop and then my stop loss was 28 cents. Right. And, and I have it always planned before the market opens. So when the market opens, mm -hmm. I'm firm on my stop loss. Yes, I can, I take the loss, whatever. But that small stop loss, the next day I'll make triple that. Right. And yeah. that's that's the benefit for me as far as having that stop loss. No. How much money? uh has tesla made you in your whole career dude like over three million yeah so your partner Trading with ellen or right? what it is both 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 yeah, both? both, yeah. that's crazy and your biggest loss ever in a, in a day in a day probably like a quarter million oh my god what was the mindset behind the trade oh, i was depressing i went yeah? to sleep right after that and sure. and, and you so said the a next whole day, day was that like multiple trades yeah it was multiple trades like just one of those mm. days where like you know i lost a hundred thousand going into you know I, I don't remember the specifics of it yeah. but it was probably like a hundred and twenty thousand dollar loss and then i ended up trying to i have chase been there it. i have been there like yeah. you 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 just lost the the control and, Correct. and there's something when you take a big loss that when you're in the trade, you don't realize it, but after it's over, you're like, there goes a car or like, <laughs> or a house for or a, a month. house in this yeah. or yeah. like, there goes like a trip. To, like, I remember my first huge loss. It was $4,000 with Tesla. And you say, and, and you said that time, oh, that was a Jordan's right there. <laughs> <laughs> but like, I, I lost $4,000 with Tesla and I was like, I, the first thing I told myself is I'm not even going to get mad because they're already gone. But then as I thought about it, and I literally like, I just said, you're really stupid that you allowed it to go that far. Yeah. Don't let that happen again. But then as I sat down and think, I was like, damn, I could have gone to Europe and like, 
yeah. live life, not like get my money, like just throw my money up into the air. But there's so many things that you could have done that, that it actually makes you like realize it and value it right afterwards. Yeah, it, it's it's crazy because also with me, I have goals and, and, and not goals, ambitions in life where like, all right, well, once I hit five million net worth, I want to buy this and I want to do this. Once I hit 10 million, I want to do this. I want to do that. So when I have losses like that, it, it sets me two said, steps yeah. behind and I'm looking at it like, damn, I could have been at this point mm-hmm, by now mm-hmm. and I could have handled that. Right. And, and I have, like 100%. I said, different business ventures that I want to do, but it takes a lot of money. Right. And, and when I have losses, it affects me because now I'm slowing down the process on my own business ventures that I need to take care of or, or a business, uh, you know, properties that I've, I was looking to buy at certain prices. And now I'm kind of hesitant on it because of the type of loss that I just took. Right. So that's that's how I do my, you know, calculations when I'm saying, all right, I took this loss. It's not like I'll say like, damn, I could have bought a Lamborghini, but I'll be (laughs) like, damn, it's two steps behind now. I got to wait a couple more months to go and do this. Right. So that that's me. I've dealt with that, too. What's one industry that you're not in that you would like to go into? One industry that I'm not in that. Because I'll I'll give you mine, for example, Uh like. If I retire, I want to be a soccer coach. <laughs> oh, cool. It might sound dumb. Like there's a lot of big things that I want to do, but <laughs> yeah. end goal is like I love soccer. I love the sport. I wish I could have been a professional, but I started playing late and I was really bad at it. No, you so, you, you were really bad, man. <laughs> I, I, was, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I got better like as time came, but <laughs> I was really bad. Like I started when I was like 15. So, yeah. but he's very good like playing basketball and all their sport. But in soccer, no, that, that's not your sport. So. <laughs> I love the sport. Literally, like, I would love to just like retire and like start. Like I've, I have my all the certifications that I want to do to become like a professional coach. Like I know what I have to do. Everything. For sure. That's what I want to do. End goal. Like what's the end goal? Yeah, the if end there's goal. one, because you, you know. He's done everything. But. End goal. I don't even know about an end goal. I mean, obviously, I want to own as much real estate as possible. You know, I want to. I just want to be. I just want to look at land one day, like passing a street and be like, I own all of that. You know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's definitely one of the goals, but I, I used to be a soccer player too. And uh, you know, I, I don't know how good or I don't know if they're joking or not. No, but, I was really bad. But yeah, I wanted to be professional as well, but in America it's very hard to do that. It is. Um, and I had to say, all right, one, one, at one point in my life, I had to say soccer or, you know, trading. And I picked trading. Because well, it wasn't really about trading, just making money right now or trying to make money in five years. You know what I mean? It's like a dream and everybody wants that dream. And I, I chose to walk away from soccer. But yeah, one day I want maybe, maybe, you know, I don't even know. But that that thing where I, I just explained where I could pass the street and be like, I own all of that. That's definitely one of my biggest goals. You know, we have professional athletes that are coming to us because yeah. they want baseball to learn players. Like baseball players. Still- and, you know, we're from the DR. Correct. A lot of baseball players and they... One thing that it's like common knowledge in the DR is that like a professional, like a kid gets drafted, they're 16, 18, they get a hundred thousand dollars, half a million, a million, four million. Recently we had a kid who had like 5.2. Yeah, but we're lacking financial education. Yeah, like yeah. But it's lacking financial education. So they're like coming more trying to like learn how to invest their money. Correct. And I think that I, like it, it, it's just clicked on with me when you said, oh, I'm 16, I have to choose. Yeah. You know, I think it's pretty interesting that athletes now are like crossing the line. One thing that you've just set up, like you're winning the watch contest in the podcast right now, <laughs> like the, the competition is on. How how do you go about watches? Like, how do you get into watches? What was your first watch? Because we all here like watches. Yeah. Like, do you we see all it like an do. investment or just for fun? So originally I loved watches okay. and, and, and you would be able to walk into a store any day of the week and be able to just grab a watch when I was collecting watches. And then, you know, at one point in life, I, I, I was being able to walk in and, and you know what a presidential yeah, Rolex yeah, is, right? Yeah, yeah, of course. The, the gold wasn't a big factor back then. People didn't really care about gold and gold wasn't selling. So, for example, back then when I walk in and I want to buy a presidential watch, it would be 20% off at the Rolex store. Now, if you walk into a Rolex store, you can't. No, you can't there's nothing. Wait a minute. For yeah, everything. You, there's nothing that's in the show. you have a nice day. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, Get I was collecting. List. As soon as I was getting money, I loved watches. I was collecting them. Um, I also knew that it had some sort of value. And, and it was it was an investment. Uh, but it, it might have not been the greatest investments back then. Now it's great investments. And I was collecting it throughout the years. 
And, you know, I just love watches. I feel like if the two things I love in life, as far as like buying, it would be watches and cars. What was the first watch that you bought that you felt like, okay, I have a nice watch. And it was before or after McLaren? Before. So, okay. so the original watch. Wow. Yeah. That was first watch I ever bought was a Rolex Datejust. Um, the first watch where I said, yo, I really have a nice watch was a Rolex presidential. because the weight of that watch, it's heavy, it's gold mm -hmm. and it just sits on your wrist and it just feels good. You know what I mean? It, it makes you feel like you're, you, you're dressed up for the day. So sure. I feel like that was the first watch where I said that. What do you transition after Rolex? Like uh, I ended up getting a Royal Oak, uh, AP, AP and then I didn't, I didn't start getting Richard Mills until like last year. How many do you have right now? Three, three. And how do you f like, actually two, one got taken in the home invasion. Yeah. It, how do you go there? Like, because there's a big jump from like a day just to like a Richard Mill, which is, what are you wearing right now? Uh, this is a Richard Mill, uh, you know, this is an Asian edition. I don't know if you've seen it, but you can see it right there. No, it. It's dope. Yeah. What's the price tag on it? This is uh, about four hundred thousand. Four hundred thousand. Yeah. Nice. Um, let me ask you something, uh, Noor. What do you think of Dubai right now? I love it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm a, I'm Middle Eastern also as well, so it might be a little biased, but honestly, the city's growing. Uh, you know, taxes, how it works out there. You know, being able to buy houses and and apartments very seamlessly. It's very quick. And just the, the type of connections out there, it's, it's beautiful. I'm thinking of moving here to Miami with Jan uh, uh, and Philly as well. He's, he's thinking of moving here. But uh, do you recommend us to go to Dubai? And why? So the problem with Dubai is once you move to Dubai, you're now 15 hours away from anywhere in America. You know what I mean? So like visiting family isn't something you could do on a weekly basis. Visiting friends. Um, and it's not easy for a friend to come. It's pretty expensive, you know, unless I'm obviously or someone's buying their ticket. But it's not something that someone can do every two weeks. So the, the problem with Dubai is you separate your life. And if you're going to go to Dubai, you just have to devote the next five years to strictly working. Right? Shout There out is, to Umar. Exactly. So you've got to strictly devote your time to that. And now, obviously, Miami is great because there's no state tax, right? Yeah. Um, and it, it's great because if I want to go to the furthest spot, in America or, or one of the furthest spots, California, it's six hour flight. So that's something you could take every two weeks. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But now we're talking about a 15 hour flight. Yeah. So it's when very I move to Dubai, I, I definitely am next year. I'm going to do three months in Dubai, three months in Miami, three months in New York and three months in Miami. Did I say that right? Yeah. <laughs> LA, Miami, LA. Oh, you yeah. LA. New York you LA. and Dubai. Yeah. yeah, and maybe maybe uh, one month in the art, right? Yeah, no, no, no definitely. <laughs> If it's with you guys, for sure, <laughs> we'll bring <laughs> you on. Will. So, uh, um, you know, Noor, um, our thing is huge. Like, we have people like George. Oh, George, he's one of the best day traders in the art. Also, like Carlo May, he's like a brain. But we also have a little genius in the team. You you, you remember Jimmy Neutron from the yeah yeah, yeah yeah. So we got like a. a Our version of uh, Jimmy Neutron, and uh -huh. I want to introduce to uh, to you uh, is Omar Del Toro. So I'm gonna let you keep it rolling from here, bro. Cool. Thank you. Thank you, bro. <laughs> Yo, what's up, Noor? What's up, bro? How are it's, you? It's so funny um, how we connected and how we reach out. Um, beforehand, I remember I used to before Avacus and before everything is back 2018, I believe. Um, I used to watch a lot of YouTube videos, and I saw an interview. Uh, we spoke about that earlier, um, where you were talking about options trading, and there was a lot of hate, I remember. Mm -hmm. um, people back then, and still, like, people now grasp people the film. Yeah, I don't, yeah, people like to, I don't know, people like to do great things. But um, I remember you had to go back and they trade live. Like, I want to know, like, a little bit, because that's when you, like, opened your, your channel, you were talking about, like, how was the experience and how do you handle, like, all that hate? So it was like my first ever big interview and I went on the, the interview and obviously when you do an interview, uh, they let you know all the questions beforehand. And even after, if they don't let you know, they'll ask you, do you want to keep these you know, questions? So the interview went great. Um, a lot of people thought that, you know, the interviewer was being, you know, aggressive, but we, we agreed on all that. The, the video can't go live unless I say it goes live. You know By the way, we, we don't do that here. We don't give the uh, answers or questions before. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but, um, 
that that's how it worked in those in those interviews. So, like, this like is, a TV this interview. This is like a podcast. Yeah, I mean, we're having yeah. a conversation and stuff like that. Over there, it was it's an interview, so he'll either let you know the the questions or tell you after. Do you want to keep it? Um, but yeah, it was it was my first big interview. Got a bunch of comments saying yeah, whatever, blah blah blah. He doesn't actually trade, so I was like, yo, let's run it back and let me let me day trade live in front of everyone. You can record my screen and I'll screen record at the same time. So we ended up doing that. I made about three thousand dollars live, mm-hmm. and the pro and the crazy part is TD Ameritrade was down that day. Yeah, and uh, I still ended up making three thousand dollars. I did it live, and he ended up trading with me and made like three hundred, five hundred bucks on Robinhood. Mm-hmm. So like, even with that type of uh, you know, proof or or that type of you know, content. People still hate in the comments, so yeah, there's nothing I, I could do about it. But there's and, a and big thing, really quick. There's a big thing in our industry that there's a lot of traders posting profits online, and yeah. it's really hard to like know who's really legit, legit. Like, and there's there's something weird as well. Like, after you've been in the industry for certain time you know you kind of get a gut feeling of like who's yeah, actually right away. making a profit yeah, right away. yeah or not that's that's yeah and yeah. i remember um after that even you showed um live trade on, on on the video then they start comparing the discourse like you were getting images from some of the discord yeah. and all the drama it was just insane um i'm talking about the discord because how we reach out to you I remember um, I called your number. I actually got your number um, because back then uh, when you first opened your signals chat, um, one of our team members and our friend, Jose, shout out to Jose, um, he had a problem with the Discord and he tried to reach out um, to support, right? And when he called, it was actually you on the phone. Yeah. And you were like, he was like, hey, I need support. You were like, hey, what's up, man? And he was like, hey, are you new? What's up? Yeah. And <laughs> so you used to do the support for your Discord channel? So I, I, I answer some phone calls. Uh, a lot of it gets forwarded to, you know, the, the team. But uh, for the most part, I, I, I try to be there on the front line because, like I said, uh, like I make sure that everything is taken care of. If someone feels some type of way about any of my businesses, I want to be the first person to be like, okay, let, let me take care of it. This is how we're going to take care of it. That's yeah. what's up. And it's funny because... Trading is a psychology game, and you have a Discord, right? Two thousand members. Um, how do you handle like like by now? It's you have a year doing it, but at first, how do you handle like actually the pressure of trading and like showing beforehand and afterhand? Afterhand, because of course, when you trade and you show what you're doing, you probably feel like a little pressure, right? Of course. And along with that, I like to know, and we know the answer, but there's a lot of viewers that maybe um, are still learning and aren't in like the first phase of trading. Is there also secret sauce for your trading? Like, what does your trading do that makes you so much cash? I think it was. I think it's honestly discipline, uh, and it's not secret sauce. I feel like everybody can do what I do. You know, obviously, it takes years. It's like it's like becoming a doctor and then the best doctor, right? Yeah. And I just keep comparing it to that because, like I said, the people come into this industry thinking it's about to be you know cupcakes. Now, some people do end up making it cupcakes. They can make a lot of money in the first month or two, and then some people end up struggling. Right. And, and everybody has their course of learning and course of, you know, success. So, you know, it is it is something that, you know, I, I mainly focus on and it's the discipline part. And at the beginning, yes, it was very stressful. And over time, I just learned how to, you know. Put it into my life where it doesn't affect me, like and don't focus too much on people watching me because, mm-hmm. you know, trade live every single day, even though it was me before just me. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, it took some time. Definitely. I would say like at least two, three years before I got very comfortable with it. And now it's just like a, you know, a, a thing, part of my schedule every single day. Do you so think no, trading live really quick? Do you think trading live made you a better trader? I feel like it allows me to be very hard on myself when it comes to trading, because I have to remember people are watching me. I can't just let something slip and then be like, all right, I'll, I'll take it if, when this candle closes. You know, you know all the all the things that we talk about psychology, and I feel like that's helped my psycho- psychology because uh, I know people are watching. So it helps me be far more stricter on myself when it comes down to trading. So, okay. Noor, is Noor Trade just you, or is Noor Trade a team of five people, ten people, a hundred people? So Noor Trades is nor and then i have stock hours right stock hours is the discord and then i have a full team for that people who like like i said you have a full team here and like, it's great like a corporation exactly. employ people exactly and it's, it's it all starts with members like every employee that i have started with members and i see them working very hard developing 
they're trading over time, starting at one point, being at one point. And uh, it all started with them being a member and then becoming, uh, you know, a, a part actual of the team. trader. Yeah, and being part of the team. Same like us. Like, we started mm -hmm. together five years ago. Yeah. And now our team is... Yeah. It's, yeah, yeah and that's the beauty yeah, of the market. Numbers. That's the beauty that's of it. the market and trading, honestly, um, because you are, don't only get the cash and the money, but you also get to know people, right? And I was I was wondering, like, a part of cash, freedom, what's um, the best or biggest thing you have got from trading or the market? Like, it's it meeting someone? Like, what is it, aside of money, you have gotten from the market? Gotten from the market? Uh, just a lot of people changing their lives you know, on a yearly basis and, and, and honestly being able to help uh, a lot of different, you know, friends and family members and just seeing the success of other people makes me happy because I remember starting out and I felt like it was rocket science. I didn't have the help and, and YouTube at the time wasn't YouTube, right? It wasn't the, the way YouTube is now where you can search up literally anything and educate yourself. Who was your mentor? I didn't have one because there was at the time, like trying to search up options there really, there really wasn't anything on the internet. It's now, so hard. It, it was all basically, you know, an experiment. Testing something. If it works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. All right, next to the, to the next thing. As far as like mentor, I, I mean, you know, Wall Street, I can't even say my internship on Wall Street was a good mentorship because it was just, it was just bringing me into the industry. I didn't get to actually trade or, or get to sit by someone and ask him questions because they didn't have time for that. You, you took know? the rough um, road. How long? So from I, your viewpoint... How much money do you need to have? Like a person that's going to the roof when more money is just blah. It's just uh, another million. I don't need it. <laughs> I appreciate it, but I don't need it. 50 million, 40 million, 100 million. Um, it looks like you want to be a billionaire. So you're basically <laughs> asking me when is it enough? Ah. Uh, because you can only like buy certain cars, certain mansions, certain trips. And there comes the point where more money is just like, you're gonna not really going to use it. Yeah. And honestly, uh, it's just at that point, like, do you want to buy big yachts, private jets? And I'm not really into that type of stuff. Like I said, exactly. I, 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 I try to live as simple as possible. Obviously, I love having fun and, and nothing could nobody can tell me not to like all those comments like you're spending too much money mm -hmm. or i worked i worked hard for it and it comes to a point where i want to spend money on me and my family my friends let them see that side of the world and stuff like that so as far as money wise i feel like i'm i'm almost there but i'm not there you know what i mean I, i'm far from it but i'm close to it at the same time i feel like after like that 30 million mark life yeah, is the same yeah. life's the same you know even maybe after the 20 mark i can't tell you yet because i'm not there but maybe after that 20 million mark, life will probably be the same. Yeah. When, what was the, la the last thing you wanted to buy and you said, wow, I'm not ready for that yet? Oh, uh, last thing I was going to buy. I probably you had the money, but you know, you knew it wasn't the best use for it. Ah, uh, yeah. So I would say the last thing I was going to buy was... Uh, Probably a McLaren P1. P1. That's yeah. like 1.8. Yeah. It, it, I mean, it was before COVID though. It, it was closer to like 1.4 around there. And I'm like, should I pull the trigger? Because at the at P1 is an investment too. Yeah, it is. You know, you, you see it even the past few years, it's, the older models are still going up in value. Yeah. Yeah. So it, 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 it was more of like just having that in my driveway. But then I looked at it and said, yo, you know. I, That's 20 apartments. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Like, and I, I'm, I'm currently focused on building schools in Africa yeah, and, and, nice. and helping other people and stuff and like that. And also you told me uh, when we were with Mr. Billionaire Barber, shout out to him, <laughs> that you were going to buy the best one here, here in Miami, probably the whole world. For sure. <laughs> <laughs> that you were thinking of purchasing some complexes in Utah. Why Utah? So the, it's not that I want to. I just have a connection out in Utah uh, where I can buy any apartment complex or, or, or I would say majority of the apartment complex complexes uh, available. I have someone that can help me turn it into Section 8. Right. OK. Um, it's just a connection that I have in Utah. Obviously, if I had it in California or Texas, I would do it over there. But Utah is the specific place that I have that particular. It doesn't connection. sound sexy. But yeah, when exactly. it comes to business, exactly, yeah, and I think it's it's beautiful that you're giving back um, to the community, to the people, 
And also, I think it's important um, to people watching um, to give back to them. What's a roadmap for success in trading that you will recommend the viewers right now? Like if they were starting from zero or even intermediate, like what will you suggest them do like on a one, two, three step basis to get profitable in trading? So one, two, three step. I don't know about one, two, three step, but I could say a few things to focus on. Like one of them is don't focus on what other people are making online because a lot Preach. of it, like I said, is BS. You Preach. Them all. That, that also sets you back because all you want to do is make as much money as them and, you know, you put too much risk on the line. I've been there before and that's why I can say that. I've literally seen people make like 50000 in a day and this is the time where I'm making three to 5000 I'm not understanding how that's even possible, yep. right? And I ended up finding out that it wasn't even real in the first place, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So a lot of that can set you back. Um, another thing is educating yourself is a very big factor. A lot of people just want to start, start, start. And then you look at why I'm telling you focus, look at lawyers, look at doctors, look at engineers, look at, you know, chemical engineers, right? They had to go to school and educate themselves before they can even put themselves on the front line, right? Educate yourself. And, you know, the third thing I would say is, you know, find a community where you feel most comfortable that you can ask questions and, and, and basically, you know, understand, like, for example, you know, like you said, the, the, um, the Spanish community mm -hmm. is growing on a, yep. on a very fast scale. And you guys are the people to go to for that, right? Yeah. And you know, if 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 someone can't speak English, for example, or 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 are from foreign countries, there's always a community for them, and it's just finding the right community for them. And and that's I feel like those are the biggest things when it comes down to starting off trading. Yeah, Noor, I want to say for myself, thank you very much. Um, I. It's really nice to meet a person who's 23 years old and has like the mindset that you have because when I was 23, I moved to Miami when I was 20. I came by myself and it was really hard for me to like mature and like build up myself. Ended up happening later on life and you're 23 and you're making this happen. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much. I want to give Carlos uh, a chance to sit down with you. I know he has a few questions and Carlos is a pretty interesting person in our team because he's, a, he's an engineer and mm -hmm. when we sit down, and we brainstorm the way that he thinks and that like he approaches not only life, but also like business is pretty structured. So I'm pretty sure he has a few nice questions that he would like to ask you. The semiconductor. You know, <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Thanks. What's up, no Noor? Nice to meet you. Hey, man, I just got to say, uh, you have a pretty good, kind of like, candid uh, smile and face. That's the first thing I noticed this morning when I saw you. I was like, this guy is cool. Like, just by looking at your smile, Thank I can you. say you're legit. Dr. G. <laughs> yeah. We've been lucky with the people we have been meeting. Yeah, it's uh, great. In this week, like, yeah. very humble people. People that, like, focus in life, and that's awesome. Yeah, I love yeah. Dr. G, actually. He's a very humble person. Um, He, he can educate you on a a lot of different things different that you don't even know about. Yeah. 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 What's the what's the the biggest lesson you learned from, from honestly, Dr. G? Honestly, with Dr. G, forget about even lessons. He's very big on faith, like being positive. Yeah. You know, you see the smile on his face yeah. when he talks to you. It's always uplifting and and just holding you up as he talks at the same time. So. Uh, obviously, he's very appreciative in the community, and he's not even a trader or anything like that. You know, he has nothing. Well, to he, he starts to trade. Right? Yeah. Like, yeah. Now he is. Yeah. But I'm yeah. saying, as far as like years, yeah, 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 yeah he was yeah, like yeah. that years ago. You yeah, know, yeah. What correct. I mean? yeah. But yeah, he's a very dope person. Cool, cool, cool. So you know, you were talking about profits and about like roadmap for for people. You know, I think like it's very hard for a trader to become profitable. Uh, and, and sometimes you get good at it. You get good at technical analysis, fundamental analysis, even psychology. But then you have like a couple bad weeks even days and then it takes you back and yeah. then and then the entire year you're red mm -hmm. and it's like so two questions there how long did it take you to become like a profitable consistent trader uh and then how do you get back from the losses um for those weeks that you're red like how do you recover psychologically emotionally how do you do that so first of all this is also like this is the hard part of my story right this is the this is the part where i don't like talking about because i don't want people to believe that it's easy, right? For me, Correct. I never blew an account, right? I, I I was profitable. Obviously, I was getting lucky. I hit a pretty big win on earnings. I, I think I was explaining it to someone here earlier. Yeah, I was explaining it to, you know, uh, one of your, your members, our team, and I was telling him that I hit an earnings play and I didn't know you can lose all your money on earnings. Yeah. And I went all in. Like I said, I was learning options by myself, right? So. Oh, yeah. 
Yep. So I ended up going from like 23,000 in my portfolio to 84 overnight, not knowing that I could have went to zero. Yeah. Right. And, and that definitely helped me boost, uh, you know, yeah, my, that's my success. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the hard part of talking about my story because I don't like explaining that. And then people think, oh, he did it overnight and, and all that good stuff. So I didn't I didn't go through that part where I, I was read at the beginning and, and all that good stuff. But would I have you know explained it or would I have talked about it if I did? A hundred percent, because it allows people to understand they're not by themselves if they're going through, you know, hardships and trading. So you went from twenty three to eighty four. Yeah, that was kind of like a big jump. So it's like a three X overnight. Correct. H how do you go from there to kind of like millions now? Right. Like, so you said you have positions like over a million dollars, 250. Um, how long did it take you to be there? Because like it's not the same psychology before you were doing like 20 K size positions and then you are 84. Do you go like straight up like full size accounts or I just want to like understand the process a little bit better. Yeah. I, after I hit that big win, I focused a lot on education. I went back to smaller positions um, just to understand how contracts move, what's Delta, what's Theta, all the Greeks, and, and, and just understanding, you know, the options market because it's a whole different industry when you come into that. Yeah. What were you tracking? When you uh, say education, what you yourself thought, what were you tracking? I, was, I wanted to know how options moved in correlation to the actual stock and how stocks, mm, you know, yeah. you know how stocks moved in correlation to the overall market and understanding the characteristics of certain stocks. So that was a lot of things that I was focused on because I said, whoa, now I have a pool of money now. I don't want to mess this up like I've seen online. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? And, uh, you know, as far as sizing over time, it took a very long time. I didn't I didn't actually do these crazy positions until like July. Mm, yeah, like June, July of 2022. OK, before that, it was really like 50K to 100K positions. Obviously, before that it was 20K positions and, and 15K positions. So over time, it just, you know, every three, four five months, I would feel like, okay, this I'm comfortable to move to the next step. And I feel like that last step that I took, like I said, last year where I was going in with a half a million dollars, I think I went too far as far as like skipping a level, you know? Yeah. And, and I felt, and, and even though I didn't lose money mm -hmm. after that process, I still felt like it was a little too quick for me. I don't mean to interrupt. Sorry, but I just don't want this to go unnoticed. So a big thing when I started trading was like, okay, I have this amount of money. How much do I put into my position? And now I know the answer. But I would like to understand your approach because I think the biggest thing when it comes to risk is size. Yes. Correct. Because, mm -hmm. yeah, you, you can have a 10% stop loss. Let's just give it a number. But 10% mm -hmm. out of how much? Yeah. And exactly. it, it's a big thing when you start scaling up when you're trading. If you go too fast, you're going to burn a lot of cash because that 10% can be really rough on you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. what was your approach like full capital versus position size at that moment? Correct. And, and the way you explained it, for example, if I have a 5K account and I go all in with my 5K and I lose 10%, that's $500. That's right? a big draw now. That's yeah. Now I'm at 4500 Now, if I make 10% on my next trade with 4500 that's only $450. Yeah. yeah. So, so you have to remember when you take these big L's or if you lose 20% on your whole portfolio, you, it's not, you don't have, you, it's not just 20% to make back. Now you have to make 30, 40% depending on what type of position and mm -hmm. how big your portfolio is. So a lot of people don't understand that as far as how to, you know, start, I would start very lightly, honestly. And, and, and when I say lightly, I mean, literally lightly, like educate yourself like I did. Right. And obviously, you know, there are a lot of things that I skipped and I got lucky to get past and not blow my account. Yeah. Right. And, and, and let's just say I have a big pool of money where I have 50,000 that I'm ready to invest. Just because I have 50,000 doesn't mean I'm going to put all 50,000 into, you know, my trading portfolio and start from there. So when I when I see people start with five, ten thousand dollars, I'm like, yo, you should not be going in with more than like five hundred bucks. Even, even one hundred dollars. Yeah, like, let's like, say in, in, in Latin America and in exactly. Dominican Republic, for example, like five hundred dollars is a lot. Mm -hmm. You know, like you have to work. It's like least, a month's salary for a lot of people. Yeah, yeah but I heard about a, that. like a very good month's salary. So um, sometimes I tell to my students, also the the other mentors in, in, at Abacus, like you should start trading with fifty bucks, one hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. Like exactly. take it easy, man. You know the market has been here for decades, More than for years. yeah, yep. for a hundred years. So you can go on your own pace. 100%. And I would like to know what's your strategy, like smart money, supply, demand, key levels, uh, big WAP. I don't know. Uh, how do you see the markets? So I don't the, really use um, indicators. 
uh, everybody has their own way of trading. Personally, I'm not a fan of indicators. I don't have, well, just EMAs, like EMAs, yes. AMA, yeah. yeah. EMAs. And I know there's moving averages that are great and 100%, I, I know there are a few things, but you have to remember if there was indicators that literally told you when to buy and sell, everybody would be a billionaire <laughs> yeah, right now, exactly. right? And, and you have to understand that people would have done that a long time ago. Yeah, yes. but th there's something I saw on, on your screen this morning. It was like little um, arrows. Arrows. Yeah. So that's What's my that? own indicator that I've made myself, mm. right? And that's, it doesn't help me trade. It's just a switch on momentum. Are you sure about that? <laughs> <laughs> that's the <a> circuit sauce. <laughs> <laughs> I wish. I no, wish. How important are fundamentals to you? Like CPI, uh, bad earnings, good earnings, news on Apple stocks, BD stocks. Now with AI, and BD is, is on top. Um, how much weight do you put on it? So fundamentals are very important in a way, right? I, I, I like to focus or, or understand fundamentals because then I'll know how these specific stocks will react to a certain CPI number or, yeah. you know, a certain PMI number or a certain, you know, Fed meeting, right? So as far as, you know, fundamentals, it may not be extremely important to, you know, scalping, you know, the second to second, but it is important understanding the market and how your certain stocks will move to certain news, right? Yeah. And, and, and it's also very good because when you sit in a room and you understand fundamentals, you can have a conversation oh, yeah. with bigger players. No, right? that's, that's, that's one yeah. of the yeah, best yeah. benefits that like the world of investing in stock has yeah. brought me is that exactly. I, can, I can talk about any type of business. That's correct. true. Any type of industry, yeah. like money, it, it's, it brings you that value to you. Exactly. And, and, and it's a, it's a big thing when I'm sitting in a room with billionaires and millionaires <laughs> and multimillionaires far bigger than what I've done, you know? And, and when I sit in that room, I obviously want to sit there and listen more than I want to talk. But when that question comes up or when they're having that conversation, I want to be able to join that and understand it. Now, fundamentals, is it good for trading to understand? Will it help you? It can, because during certain Fed, you know, meetings and you understand how a certain, you know, Fed meeting or, or Fed news can affect the stock market, you'll be able to know how to react in certain, you know, quick times. So how many percent of, of like all those millionaires? Phil is back. Yeah, he, <laughs> <laughs> welcome back, man. He couldn't say, yeah, that's good. I, lo I love it. I have fundamentals. I have to go. Yeah. <laughs> so what yeah. percentage of all those like millionaires, billionaires, would you say that they own a stock portfolio? I would say that a lot of them do. I would say I would say out of the people I know, I would say 90 plus percent. I would That's say crazy. out of all of them, I would say 70 plus percent. It's true. And the reason I say that is even if they don't mainly focus on the stock market, they still believe in the long term effects because it's a proven thing, yeah. right? Think about it. If you you can go to the chart and look at the last 30 years, are we higher or lower? Higher, we're higher. far higher, right? Far higher. Now it's proven it's fact for the last hundred years or, or however long the stock market has been here that the stock market will be higher in the next 10, 20 years, no matter how you put it. Hallelujah. Right? Whether you like it or not, whether you deal with the COVID or, or recessions, or no matter what, yeah. we've always come back and been higher. Yeah. So billionaires know that multi-millionaires know that so even if real estate is their main focus they still have money in the s p rolling around mm. whether they believe in the nasdaq it doesn't matter they still have money in there somewhere yeah right and Noor, question talk to me can you extrapolate your knowledge from the market to do good in real estate it helps me because trading in the stock market like i said even the fundamentals even if it's not the best for scalping it's still something for long term, understanding where we are with interest rates and, and all that exactly. good stuff. Mm -hmm. Right. And when it comes down to real estate, I understand where we are in the cycle of the economy just because how far deep I am in my trading career. I understand what's going on with the economy. I'm not on the bias thing where mm -hmm. political po politics matters, Republican, Democrat. When you're in trading, none of that stuff matters anymore. It's yeah. all about where the economy is at, where we're headed. Where's the money flowing? Exactly. Yeah. It's and only you on the screen. Exactly. And I can come into real estate and understand where are we going hmm. as far as the economy and, and where should I invest in and how should I look at different investments? So to go into stocks and trading, the entry ticket is very low. Could be a hundred bucks. Mm -hmm. You can start trading. But what's the entry ticket for real estate investing? See, commercial is different. I, I've learned commercial takes a lot, and and uh, there's a lot of syndication process, uh, pro, um, 
it's a lot of syndication projects uh, when it comes down commercial where mul- multiple investors come in. But I would say entry level for commercials are right around half a million dollars if you want a great project. Mm-hmm. You know, a, a decent project, I would yeah. say. Um, maybe there's less, you know, maybe there's more. But for a decent project, I would say entry level is about a half a million. Uh, as far as... For you, down payment? Down payment, correct. And and, and and for the most part, that's all you really need in, in those types of, you know, projects. But, uh, you know, as far as, you know, real estate for two family homes, three family homes, whatever the case may be, I feel like the entry on that is right around, you know, the 20,000, mm-hmm. 30,000. Obviously, less if it's your first time owner. You know, yeah. there, there are different factors, yeah. but I feel like that's very, very much reasonable. The, the ten thousand to thirty thousand dollar mark as the entry level. Yeah, yeah, and going back to day trading, um, I remember in this same conversation, um, you guys were talking about you had a portfolio. It's funny because you first started day trading. You don't have a portfolio now, but you had it when you started day trading. Correct. And Gene is, um, he's always talking and preaching about how when you start trading. You first have to, you need to have a portfolio, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. Um, 90% portfolio, 10% day trading. Yeah. Um, because it minimizes your risk, right? Correct. So um, how will you say um, in that moment after you remove your portfolio from the equation, that affected your trading psychology? I feel like it, it's. I'm so far down that it doesn't really affect my psychology. Maybe if I did it earlier. Mm. Um, but like, like I said, the earlier mindset was make money from trading mm-hmm. and then putting into longer term investments. Yeah. And then that was the portfolio thing. And then obviously I, I, I ended up having a portfolio even years after I started. And then, like I said, there was a cycle where I said, okay, let me walk out of this. I don't know where the economy is headed and all that good stuff. Uh, but even now it, it doesn't really affect me because now I'm into the real estate market. Mm-hmm. So that's almost like my long term portfolio. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's I good. understand it now. And it's good. You first took the approach in trading, like you were really successful at trading and then you jump into real estate. Something that happens to us entrepreneurs is that we have the um, shiny object syndrome, right? Um, did you ever have that? Like you were trading, you probably first few years didn't do as good. Um, did you try to do something else? Like, I don't know, Amazon FBA, e-commerce, like. Nah, I, I honestly, that type of stuff doesn't really attract me because let me tell you one thing about trading. The more people that come into the trading world doesn't affect my trading. Uh, just because some of thousands of more people come into, you know, a contract doesn't affect my trading. Mm-hmm. Now, when it comes to Amazon selling online, if thousands of people selling the same product as you, your profit margins are going to be far lower. Your mm-hmm. sales are going to be far Supply lower. Supply and demand right exactly. there. Exactly. And, and trading, the more people that come into the stock market, even better for me, you know, yeah, there's I know more money flowing in. Exactly. And, you know, just like, just like these other businesses people try to go into. And I, I, I understand the stock market and it's almost like being biased. Like I said, yep. if you're into real estate, they're going to tell you real estate's the best. And in trading, I'm going to tell you, I feel like trading is the best and I can name you the, the certain factors why I think it's the best. And when I think, when I think of trading, how can it end? You yep. know, are, are more people going to affect me coming into the stock market? No. At the end of the day, it might even help me. Yeah. Right? It will. Yeah. And you know, it's more liquidity. There's Yeah, there's a conversation mm-hmm. about that, about people getting on the market. There's a lot of speculation and different trading strategies. Um, liquidity, manipulation. Like, what do you actually think about that smart money concepts and liquidity, manipulation of the market? Do you think that's real or is that just... Of um, course it's real. Yeah. What are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, it's real. It's, it's real for sure. <laughs> that's the way I trade. <laughs> yeah. And um, it's cool because obviously with larger uh, pools of money, like I said, big hedge funds can affect stock prices yeah, and, and supply and demand zones. We know what that is. You know, yep. the, you know, big orders are lined up at certain spots on either side. And, you know, that's why you see crazy bounces and crazy rejections. There's just large sell orders. And yeah, so as far as like larger banks, they can affect, you know, stock prices. So you talked about uh, how you went back and educated yourself. So that's a big thing. Obviously, we have an ad tech company. Uh, we're big into education. Definitely. So what are what are your favorite books or where do you go mm. to for education as far as like what's your go back to education? Do you like books better? Audiobooks? books? Uh, do you like podcasts? Do you like, I don't know, YouTube documentaries? So like favorite book and what's your go to for education? 
I feel like my mind is always like moving. So it's very hard for me to watch long podcasts, even though I, I love watching them, you know, and, and, and I figure out a way where I can watch them. I just speed it up on YouTube now. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I do love books. I love reading about other people, what they went through, for example, Ray Dalio and principles, right? I love great book. That's Bill the Bible Ackman. of finance. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I love Bill Ackman and, and just, just a, a few goats in the industry to, to look at and see how they went, what they went through, how they did it. How many times did they have to go back to zero? And you would be surprised to see these big billionaires that everybody looks up to. How many times that they have to go back to zero during their whole, you know, process. So yeah, yeah I love reading about other people and how they did it. I think Ray Dalio got broke three times. Exactly. Oh, yeah. And before he got like Bridgewater. Yeah. And even maybe four is. times I was reading and, and, and it's just crazy because every time he thought he found something and he was making mm-hmm. money from it, boom, it would just be snatched from him. And, and it's crazy because you could be going through something in your life and, you know, you think you're the only person going through yeah. it in your life. And what's crazy is the people that we look up to have been done that gone through that and you know and then they, they, they came through with success and yeah. it's very possible yeah. for talking, everybody talking about principles from ray dalio what are the principle of nor like your principles which so, are so my personal principles there's there's a lot of it you know um you know as far as principles i, I take a lot of things serious in my life and and you know uh you know how i treat people you know how i treat work Uh, and I have certain things that I abide by how to, you know, take care of business, you know, on the good side and on the bad side. So I do have principles as far as like, how do I, you know, come up with that? I I list things down that goes on in my life. I list things that I go through personal relationships, business relationships, and I always write down how to deal with things in certain, you know, situations, what are the right things to go, you know, the right ways to go about certain things. And I create certain principles so that I can never really break my rules and, mm-hmm. and, and become a different person because I have a set things that I abide by and I just continue to go on that route for, you know, the rest of my life. Do you Wait, write when, with my hand or like, uh, exactly. I like writing with my hand. I'm still kind of old school, even though my handwriting is disgusting <laughs> and it, it really does look like I'm a doctor because, you know, those handwritings. <laughs> I mean, you're, you're lefty? No, I'm already. I'm already. Yeah. yeah. And, and, uh. and when your book is coming out? Honestly, I did start writing a book. I'm, at, I'm like 150 pages in. Wow. Really? What? Yeah, but I feel like it's too early for that. I feel like. No. It's it's everything. It's like what I de- went you through in life. You later. Yeah, and I feel like <laughs> I'm only 23, and I feel like I'm gonna deal with a lot more things and go through things. And I feel like people release documentaries too early, mm-hmm. and I feel yeah. like I have a lot more time yeah, before I release. But it that. will actually help entrepreneurs. Like, actually, you're building up, right? You're yeah. still far ahead where you want to be. I'm Correct. guessing. Uh, but people actually, as far as you start progressing, you can just t- write another book. And talking about writing and all that habit stuff and principles. I like to know um, something that's really important for traders, which is journaling, right? Correct. What are North principles for journaling? How do you actually journal your trades in a way that is effective, right? Mm-hmm. So uh, one of the big reasons I journal is because on a green day, a lot of people think that everything was great, but there are so many things I could have done better on yeah, certain green true. days. And not just because I have a red day. People think you have to journal just because you're having red days. The problem with that is you won't know how to treat a green day. That's why some people go from green to reds during mm-hmm. their day because they haven't journaled on green days. So when you journal on green days, my biggest principle is making sure, sure, excuse me, that I state that what I did wrong, what I could have done better. How did I feel during my trading? Even even during the trade, how did I feel? Like, what, what, did I feel emotional? Did I feel like I should have sold yeah. earlier? Mm-hmm. Because then you... Anxious you sh- and everything. Yeah, and then you could look at it after and be like, all right, maybe I, I'm in too heavy. Maybe I'm not emotionally stable this week. And like I said, that all deals with psychology. Yeah. So I still journal every... I have, I have books at home. I can send you guys a picture so we can put it on the podcast. <laughs> yeah. Pages, bro. Like, uh, I, I still have the journals from 2017, That's 2018. That's awesome. 2018. And uh, I still abide by the same rules. So you became obsessed pretty much with writing by hand, yeah, journaling sure. every day. So yeah. how many hours would you say you've, you've dedicated to trading overall? I don't, I don't know. How many hours are in a day? 24? <laughs> Dude, I, I barely sleep. And even nowadays, I still barely sleep. And I'm okay with that because I'm on the grind, you know. And, and, and no matter how far you are, as long as you have a passion for something, you continue to be on that grind. Whether, you know, it doesn't have to be trading. But anything you do in life... If you don't have that passion, yep. then it's it's just not it's just not what it is. It's, it's not, not sustainable. Yeah, it's not sustainable. I, I'm curious in that journal, 
What was the most common mistake you had, and how did you fix it? Probably over trading, dude. Like, um, I would be up, I would be, <laughs> I would be up like five thousand for the day, and then I'll, I'll be like, I'm up, I have cushion. Yeah. And and once you tell yourself you have cushion, <laughs> and that's when things start going downhill, and I'll, I'll give away two thousand dollars, and some days I'll give up all five thousand because I think that I right, being neutral for the day is my stop loss, and and certain things like that. Um, so I feel like over trading, and you know. Uh, what are, what's another big mistake? I feel like I've done a lot over and over again. Revenge trading, maybe. Revenge trading. I feel like I feel like focusing on too many stocks at the same time. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I used to do that. Yeah. So, would you suggest to just narrow down a few stocks and focus on them? hundred percent. Yeah. I like, for example, today though, I was only looking on one stock. If it didn't come, it didn't come. Um, I would say the most you should be looking at in the morning is like three different stocks. Three. How do you decide which stocks? So the night before, this is this is just a quick summary of what I do. The night before I chart, I look at the, uh, the stocks that I like and, and, and certain levels and supply zones and demand zones, whatever I'm looking at for that stock. In the morning, what's the closest, what looks the best, what has momentum, what in correlation of the overall market is showing strength or weakness. For example, today, NVIDIA, extreme weakness against the market. Market bounced overnight. NVIDIA was the only stock that I saw on my watch list that was that far back down. I said, all right, I'm focusing on NVIDIA and that's it. Yep. And I was done mm, within the first nice. yeah. 20 seconds of the market. Yeah. And Noor, I have this question. I want you to think about it a little bit um, when you're answering. What is one question or something you will have loved someone told you when you were starting? Like it will have saved you thousands of hours, thousands of dollars, something that will have really changed the path of your trading career. Oh, all right. That's a good question. Um, One thing that would have saved me a lot of time. Uh, I would feel like just not rushing the process. I feel like I feel like I got too aggressive just because I wanted to be further in life than mm. I was. And and like I said, that was also one of the reasons why I said don't focus about, or, or try to stay away from the dollar amount of people I'm making. Even me, like if you see me post how much I made in a day, don't worry about it. it it's you. It's your own path. And and and. It took me seven years to get here, but if you do it the right way, it can take you three years. But mm -hmm. if you want to rush it, you know, you'll blow your whole account. Yep. So that's that's one of the ways that uh, I feel like that could have affected my um, like know, be, trading. Be yeah. more patient with yeah. the process. I was looking at too many people online and I yep. just wanted to be the best. And <laughs> I feel you. I was rushing it. Yeah, I feel you completely. It used to happen to me. Like I had to, with pain, man. Yeah. <laughs> I had to follow people because, like, we're young, right? You're yeah. 20, I'm 20, and since I'm, since I'm like 15, right? I'm looking at these people, successful people. You were one of them, yeah. and I was like, damn, man, what do I have to do, right? Like, yeah. I'm so young, but they're young as well. Yeah. But like, what do I don't have? Like that they have That's that I'm I not felt. doing right. And, and I've been there before. Like I said, the things that people think that nobody else is going through thousands and millions of other people are going through it too. And I went through that and there were times where, bro, I stayed in my room at night and I, I would literally like be sad. Bro. Yeah. Like I, I would be up a couple thousand for the day and not understand how this certain person made 40 grand today. And I felt like I did everything right, you know, and, and I, that affected me in, on an emotional level. And I can, I can remember those days because I used to literally sit in my room and be like, yo, like, how come I'm not as good as this person? Yeah. I feel like I'm doing everything in my power to be as good as this person. Yep. And those days have come where I hit that $100,000 in a day, $200,000. And you forget about that. Like when I hit those numbers, I have to like force myself to remind myself what I went through back then and how I looked at people and said, damn, how did they do it? And I can't, right? It's all about time and and and, and overcoming certain obstacles. So I, I want to ask you something. It's about uh, luck. Because I, I talk with a lot of people and they always say like, um, hey, man, like I feel, you know, I got lucky, you know, or I'm, I'm blessed or something like that. So do you think in your process overall, have you gotten like those lucky days? Uh, how, is there how, how has that played a factor in your success? I feel like luck is a real thing for sure, because, yeah. you know, luck can affect your life in so many different ways. But but. I believe luck is how you position yourself in life, right? If I continue to go to networking events, if I continue to be part of, you know, people who are successful and I, I have conversations with them and I, I continue to, you know, be around like minded, that luck is going to come where I meet that one person that can change my life or that one opportunity where I can finally, you know, you know, explode from my, my, my shell. But that luck came from me putting myself in the right positions and, exactly. and continuing to, you know, be disciplined on saying, okay, I'm going to continue. And going pushing through. Exactly. 
So, you know, it, 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 luck does come, but luck also is affected by the way you yeah. put yourself into certain situations and how consistent are you in in different things, whether it's trading, continuing to, you know, be on the same path and, and being disciplined. And then one day you catch that big move and you're like, finally, I, I got lucky today. You got lucky because you put your put yourself in that position. It's like work ethic, right? Exactly. Yeah, I, I believe a hundred percent believe Noor, in that. Can you tell me a, a little bit about that project that you have in Africa with the schools? Like, yeah. what that, like, why? So, so why the the real factor is I'm I'm I am from Africa. I'm I'm Egyptian. I'm African American, right? So. Uh, I, I want to go back and, and one day finally just devote my time to just kind of just helping the world, whether that's building schools, cleaning up, you know, the world and, and, and you know, making water available to everybody in the world. I just want to do everything in my power where, you know, when the day comes and I'm not here anymore, you know, my name still stands on the ground for, you know, doing the right things. Right? That's beautiful, man. Yeah, That's beautiful. Yeah. Like just yesterday we were in the podcast with uh, the billionaire barber and he was talking about the same thing, you know, like giving back, yeah, giving back to the war. And I think God called everyone uh, like to do that, you yeah. know, grow and then give back to the war, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. So that's amazing. When you go to Africa, please let her know. Of course. And maybe we can go and help you. For sure. You know? yeah. Definitely. Yeah. And there's, there's a lot more giving back than just having money. Like you can give back by being emotionally there for someone or sending letters to, you know, cancer patients in the hospital so that they can read it and be positive. There's there's no excuse to not give back in the world. And, and, and I fully believe in that because I feel like that's a big part of my life. And, and if you give off positive energy, positive energy will return yep. to you in life. That's beautiful. Yeah. Noor, millionaire, 23 successful what's next for noor uh i believe what's next is i and i really ask you if he's gonna beat warren buffett i think he stands forever honestly <laughs> in uh, the I, top right yeah yeah there's, you know there's <laughs> this is very hard but obviously um i think one of the main goals is to own a hedge fund i'm um, working on nice. that currently there's just a lot of you know licensing and and, and a lot of you know how do you say protocols it? yeah protocols and a lot of compliance. lawyer stuff yeah, yeah compliance i'm working on that right now and i feel like that's one of the the big things that i'm working on yeah but i remember um you launched the hedge fund before or you talk about it a lot on your instagram what mm -hmm. happened with that it was like a four million dollar account four million i i don't i never launched a hedge fund i believe if it was four million that was my money <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. good answer i have a, i have a small hedge fund How many other Nah, yeah, I wish I wish I, uh, I wish that I opened my hedge fund, but I'm not ready. I'm I'm taking things step by step and and um, just doing it the right way. Yeah, I think it was like with it, with the bot or something. You had like a bot, right? Never. Nah, you got the wrong account, bro. Oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, fake Nord yeah. Trades account. <laughs> yeah. I don't I don't I don't think Nord likes bots. Nah, or hell like no, that. I stay away from all that <laughs> that BS. Yeah. So Nord, um, thank you for this conversation. Thank you. Uh, for flying like from New York, New Correct. Jersey, yeah, New York, yeah, to here to Miami to to share a time with us. For Abacus, is very important to build like uh, connections and relationships as well. So come with us to build something in Africa, also in the Dominican Republic, yeah, you know, sure. and here in Miami. Sure. And so I hope uh, this is a friendship that starts today mm -hmm. and is for the long run. So God sure. bless you. I hope your like your projects start. Uh, like growing every every day like like you're a crack man like yeah. in the art we say <laughs> crack like a like a mvp you know yeah. and what goat yeah a goat, goat. thank you so bro it. thank you for everything and you have friends now in the art come anytime mango uh we have very good <laughs> San San yeah. and and a place in santo domingo for so sure. thank you my brother that's yeah, that's amazing it's man and, and we love we love taking stories like yours to my latin God. america because a lot of people in Latin America don't even know that this is a path for mm -hmm. people to mm -hmm. follow. So that's what we're doing here, right? We're spreading the, the story. We're spreading that there's there are different paths to be successful. And look at you, a millionaire 23. That's amazing, man. So let's keep spreading Thank the you. love. I appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, and how we say you had an office there. And as they say, mi casa es tu casa. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Awesome, let's guys. go, guys. Let's go, guys. In the next Trade Talks podcast. Thank you, guys.